Hello, everybody um, out there in, in wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our 19th annual John White Speaker Series here at the Northwest Montana Historical Society. It's, it, it amazes me that we've been doing this almost as long as the museum has been in existence. Had, when Central School was saved and this actually became a museum, I think that just speaks to how important the early founders and the, the early employees and the community around this place, how important they knew getting the message out to the community and finding ways to share our mission and keep history alive, how important those things were, um, not only for the past, of course, and remembering the past, but moving into the future as an organization and as a Northwest Montana community. And I'm proud that we have the ability to keep it going here in uh, 2020. Um, of course, it is, it is a little bit different this year. You know, normally we have the museum open on Sunday afternoons in the winter and everybody can come by with their friends and family and have some cookies and have some coffee and everybody can be together and experience these, these new things and learn something about our world. Um, you know, this year we're doing it a little bit differently. Um, we won't be here at the museum, but we, the best thing is, is that all of you who are watching this can watch it wherever you are and whenever you choose to watch it and with whoever you want. You know, you no longer have to be at the museum at a certain time or place. So on one hand, we're sad that we're not going to have the fellowship that we usually do. On the other hand, it's, it's such an opportunity to reach as many people as possible. So I am very, very happy to keep the John White Speaker Series going. Um, the series, of course, like I said, 19 years old, and it was named for John White, who was a longtime custodian here at Central School when it was, in fact, the junior high in the Kalispell School System. And John White just made an impression on more or less everybody that went to school here. Um, one of the nicest guys you'd meet, never had a bad word to say about anybody, and really just made students and teachers and faculty and everybody feel at home in this building. And that's still what we're trying to do here today in Central School and at the Northwest Montana History Museum. So all of that aside, um, I am super happy to introduce one of our John White Speaker Series this year and for the last couple of years, isn't that right, John? Uh, John Fraley, yeah, actually, <laughs> local author, you know, uh, three or four books to his name, including the, the one that we're going to hear about today. Um, retired from a great career uh, from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and currently a teacher, um, history teacher, John, or uh, biology, or a little bit of everything? Wildlife, wildlife conservation and biology, yeah. At um, Flathead Valley Community College. So um, I'm very excited to hear a lot more about what John has to say and, you know, hopefully hear some more about the Bob Marshall Wilderness, which I've spent a lot of time in myself. So um, uh, take it away, John. Well, thanks a lot, Jacob, for having me. And I remember the first one I did was about 2009, 2008, 2009, when Gil was there um, for my previous, a couple previous books ago. And so I've been doing it pretty consistently and I really enjoy it. Like you said, it'd be nice to be there in person, but it's, I guess, the second best thing we can come up with. And, you know, you're, you being an historian, um, I'm glad that you're going to be along on this little journey we're going to do here because you have a little better perspective. I am I am not an historian and I'm not a writer. <laughs> I'm a scientist that I got and I got into writing. Well, and for, for, for not a historian and not a writer, you seem to write a lot about history. <laughs> Yeah, when I'm ever when I'm ever at the museum and talking to you though, then I feel like, oh, this this guy's a really really historian, and you've really helped me out on my last few books. Really appreciate. Oh, thank you. It. And we have teamed up with the museum and that 2008 book. Uh, you guys were a partner in publishing that, and you've provided photos for my last two books. It's been it's been really good. But thought we'd uh, go through a PowerPoint here, but keep a split screen so we can see each other and just sort of when you see something you think I need to clarify or whatever. We'll spend maybe about 30 minutes going through that PowerPoint. I've got a few readings I want to do out of the book to honor some of the characters. And uh, then we'll do some trivia questions, put you on the spot, Jacob, and see how you do. <laughs> okay, so, so all, that, all that praise about me being a historian earlier, that, that's, that everyone out there is going to see very, very soon how empty that is. But I, I, hope, I, I, hope, I hope I don't, uh, don't mess it up too bad. 
And you've become quite a aficionado of the Bob too. You know, we, we always enjoy talking about the trips you're going on or I'm going on. So that's a lot of fun. Yep. So. So hopefully everyone can see that um, PowerPoint that I have. This is the front page of it. And the first thing, and remember, stop me anytime if you have a question, because you're the only sure. one who has questions. So that would be like representing the audience, you know. <laughs> so there is no actual subtitle of this book, but I stuck one on the cover there. If, I, if there was going to be a subtitle, it would be, it's Heroes of Bob Marshall Wilderness. It would be A Century of Adventures in America's Flagship Wilderness Area, because it is America's Flagship Wilderness Area. One of the first ones, maybe the second one to be designated before the Wilderness Act. <clears throat> and um, and it covers more than a century of adventures in there, this book, all the way from Bill Murphy and before, all the way to the young folks that you see in the upper left-hand corner that are active in there now. So that's what I tried to make it. And it consists of 14 chapters, a lot of, uh, a lot of adventures. There's a lot of humor in it that I'll be talking about. And uh, we'll just start going through some of that. <clears throat> so when you write a book like this, as you know, there's a there's dozens of personal interviews you have to do. I don't know how many I did, because especially with this one, because it was individuals that write a lot of time in the Bob. Um, news articles from the time period, government reports, site visits, and so on. And the Murphys, the, the Murphys, who are the kind of the Bob Marshall royalty from the early days. Uh, I spent a lot of time with the Murphy family, Dennis, Janie, um, Ted, who passed away before the book could come out. And I will talk more about the Murphys and uh, read a couple things from them. And then all the way up, as I said, to past uh, Smoke Elzer, to all the way to the, the people that are very active right now. And we're going to talk about Bob Marshall a little bit, too. And just to acknowledge everyone again, um, all the Forcers folks that helped me. I, I noticed you're, you're here in my um, acknowledgments. You, get, you helped me a lot with photos and just guiding me a little bit, because as I said, I'm not really a historian. I'm more of a scientist. And, uh, so I'm just sort of reporting on a lot of nature stuff in my, in my books. Um, and the folks at Far Country Press have been great to work with. And then I have to thank Bud and Moore and Bill Moore. Bud was an incredible conservationist, 40 year career at the Forest Service. He passed away in 2010, but he was one of my main mentors. And he reviewed the first two books I wrote. His son, Bill, has allowed me to use um, some of Bud's uh, writings. And Bud also did in, in this book. So looking at the location map of the of Heroes of the Bob, a lot of the folks watching are probably very familiar with this. And you can see, hopefully they, you can see on the screen my, my cursor. But you know, we have Big Prairie and then actually the scapegoat down here. There's the Chinese wall all the way on up to the head of, uh, down to the, so because the South Fork flows north, believe it or not. And, and there's Nyack West Glacier, Glacier National Park. <clears throat> And Waterton Lakes and where it all sits together and uh, we're talking about the Bob today. So a couple of the more interesting things about um, the book is Joe Murphy on the left was a cowboy and I mean he was really a cowboy. In fact his his uh, his daughter just sent me his daughter is still living in Kalispell and Joe was born in 1891 so that tells you wow. the longevity of, the, of that family. She just sent me another uh, photo. They, they set up at a bando, and they were a real cowboy family. And I don't know if you can see this, but basically this is a photo of the Murphys getting ready to do a branding in uh, many, many years ago, uh, 80 or 90 years ago. And you can see they were real cowboys, but yeah. they actually were in the Bob. They lived in the Bob. They had an actual um, special use permit where they could, could actually live in the Bob at the White River. So you see Bob Marshall here, Joe Murphy here. And uh, the thing about those two is Joe was the wilderness cowboy and Bob was the wilderness evangelist. Now they both were evangelists. Bob, um, um, Joe took a lot of groups into the Bob and, and familiarized with them from all over the country and they loved it and that helped support it. Of course, Bob was willing to, wanted to talk to anybody that'd be willing to listen about wilderness. So those two were very similar in a way, this is both of them in 1928 and where they met in the Bob. We think they met, we don't know. We know that Bob walked through. Yeah. Was and John, I, 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 love, I love how that dynamic is still present in the Bob today. You know, you, get, you have the people who take in all the trips and spend you know, weeks 
on in a horse camp and try to get into the back country and, and see everything with anybody who wants to go. And then there's people like last time I was in the Bob, you know, somebody, you know, wrapping up the PC or the, uh, the kind of the by trail. Like, isn't that, that, that's incredible that it, it's still that dynamic of those different people using the Bob for, for different ways, but still finding, um, you know, peace and serenity and beauty in that landscape. It's, it, and it just struck me how, how cool it, you know, here's me, you know, a guy from Kalispell just blown away by all of this. This guy on the Connell Divide Trail, he, he's like, stop, took, took a look around at the Chinese wall and just kept on going. Like, <laughs> it, and very much in the spirit of Bob Marshall, who, who did do, you know, 20 mile days on the regular, correct? Oh, 40 mile days. I'll be exactly. Talking. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Or, you know, the Bob is kind of for everybody because you look at the Bob all the way around that perimeter of the Bob Marshall complex. There's so many different communities and, and access points and people like, Three or four days ago, I went into the Bob and, and back in six hours. I mean, wow. places where you can, you know, you can snowshoe in or hike in, there are only a few miles to get into the wilderness. So it's very accessible. And yet, if you want to go over the top and down, it's very remote. Right. This is the Murphys here in 1911. This is Joe right here at about um, 20 years old. And this is his brother, Bob. And some of the stories in the, in the, um, in the book revolve around those two. This is, this is Joe's... Uh, basically his lodge within the Bob Marshall Wilderness that he was permitted to have starting in 1920. So it's very unusual. There was only two ever put in two pro special permits. Um, and Joe got one of them. And the other one was uh, uh, Ruby Kirkbaum who had a little uh, cabin up in Young's Creek. So there was only two special permits given. And by the way, the guy that, that uh, issued both special permits, his name escapes me right now, he's a ranger of Big Prairie. So he issued uh, Joe his permit he issued Kurt, uh, Ruby her permit, and then not too long after that, um, Ranger and Ruby ran off together. <laughs> uh. Nobody's sure exactly where they went, but California was kind of the rumor. <laughs> anyway, they all had this actual um, homestead, basically, in the wilderness. This is the White River. If you've never seen the White River, this is the vortex of the Bob. It seems like every time, everybody eventually ends up in the White River, no matter how they go in or out, if they're traveling a long ways. And you see the, the Chinese walls at the head of the White River kind of wraps around uh, and it's sheer on the east side. Uh, this, is, this area here is Rampart Mountain. Up the, in Rampart Mountain, based on a study, that uh, GPS study, is the most remote point in Montana and the second most remote point, remote point in the United States. Uh, wow. Distance from an uh, a accessible trail. Yeah, it's just amazing. This White River is just an incredible place. And, and Joe picked it out. Um, for his his um, his homestead and and I call it the heart of the Bob because it just seems like everything comes down to the White River. It's such a beautiful. You can see how how so uh, it almost looks chalky white because of the limestone and it's got but it's got an incredible fish population in it. And in my next book, Wilderness Life, I talk a lot about the White River and some of the adventures. Mm -hmm. So the Murphys were were legend in the Bob early. They were they took the first big pack trips into the Bob um, in 1919, 1920, um, a little before that. And Joe actually packed for the Forest Service on fire. So they had they were first class horsemen and had up to a hundred stock in the Bob that they took people in and out of. So this is a picture of Joe uh, packing out a mule deer actually for one of his hunters. And he also took scientists through the Bob too for different studies like plant studies and things like that. This is one of the neatest things that Joe did. It's called Trail Riders of the Wilderness. And it was a nationwide um, program where you could sign up to go into a wilderness area. Mostly the first one was the Bob. And then after that many years too. And, and just learn about wilderness. And look at these eclectic people. This is 1930s. Look at <laughs> actresses. You've got... Uh, Dancers, you've got, I mean, half of these folks are women. And this yeah. was in the 1930s. And you've got all kinds of different folks, um, all walks of life, all wanting to learn about the Bob. And, and Joe took them in there. And they all loved, by the time they came out, they were just effusively with their praise to help support wilderness. Back here, you oh, see Joe. Yeah, yeah and you see Joe there. This guy to me looks just like John Wayne. <laughs> these, are the, these are the Packers. These are the Wranglers, the Wranglers. And these three are the Murphy boys right here. And then don't this, you don't don't you love the uh, the woman with the big hat and the, the oh, lap dog? The little dog. It, it, 
really hit my curiosity up here. What's this guy with the bandana, you yeah. know? And uh, there was a couple of female parole officers and then one really good friend of Bob Marshall. So obviously Joe and Bob must have communicated in some way. So that's a, kind of the evangelism Joe was doing. Um, he had a special pamphlet he gave people. This is before the Bob was even um, assembled. This was, uh, this was, these are the primitive areas that made it. Uh, and then he would give all the guests this map and show a whole Bob Marshall and, and where they were going to go. So he was first class. And he picked the best spot in the entire world, as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, he had this West Slope, these beautiful West Slope cutthroat trout, um, big prairie, just not only seven miles from his camp. Uh -huh. And so remote, so beautiful. And then the river, the South Fork, best, best cutthroat river ever. This is 1928 when Bob dashed through about the same week. Uh, this is the first landing in the Bob, the whole book. You, you can see Joe here and another packer. And then this was the Johnson Flying, the famous Johnson Flying Service. So he was involved in everything. He was like the first of everything. So, so Joe was established in there. And in, in August of 1928, the same, as, uh, the same month as this picture was taken, the same week even, Bob Marshall traveled up the South Fork of Big Prairie and went through the Bob himself. Now people think, and this is his journal here uh, from, uh, from a California university that still has it, People think, oh, he just kind of ran to the Bob. No, it's very well planned. Bob was a Bob had a master's degree from from Harvard in forestry, and he worked for the Forest Service at the Intermountain Research Experiment Station in Missoula. He was a forester. He was an academic, and he went through the Bob because he wanted to learn how a big wilderness was managed. So I thought I'd throw this in. On August 27th, he arrived in the Flathead from Missoula. He took notes on everything he did, so we we know exactly what he did and who he met. You know, most of the time. So on August 28th, he hiked over the Swan Range, like go, we went through basically Jewel Basin and came out at Elk Park Ranger Station. Now, Elk Park Ranger Station right now is under Hungry Horse Reservoir, but back then it was along the South Fork. So when he reached Elk Park, his supplies were waiting for him. So this was all organized and he got a truck ride to Spotted Bear uh, Ranger Station. And there he met the Ranger uh, crew and also met jo Charles Jackson Hash, who's Sally Hash, a friend of the museum. That was her great, her grandfather as I understand it. And there was a lot of people there that wanted to talk to Bob Marshall. Obviously, this wasn't just some random thing. When he got to Spotted Bear, there was, right. a, you know, the forest supervisor, the Flathead National Forest, and then, he, and then the deputy forest supervisor, they were all there because they wanted to meet Bob. And you can see some of his journals here. So, so John, um, how, how did Bob Marshall then become such a, a celebrity that everybody wanted to see him? That's a that's a great question, and he, he <laughs> sorry, <laughs> no, and in, in the Adirondacks, and climbed every basically as a as a young man climbed every peak that was over four thousand feet in the Adirondacks, and then and then he he just wanted he loved Lewis and Clark, and he wanted to know where there was a blank space on the map. Well, the first thing he wanted to do is get his degrees. He went to uh, he got those like Harvard and then in New York, and then he and then we'll get to it. He went on to get his PhD at John Hopkins, but. Just the power of his personality. He and then this is this fits right into the question you asked because he wrote the day he uh, the day he met um, the forest supervisor and rode up to Spotted Bear after walking 37 miles over the top of the Jewel Basin. The Forest Service has a publication that came, uh, comes out called the Service Bulletin. Back then, you could not find this anywhere. I finally, as Susan Matter at the FPCC Library found this for me very obscure, it's called Wilderness as a Minority Right, but uh, that had just come out the day he was riding up to Spotted Bear with, with Ormsby in that truck, and you know what Bob was talking about. He was talking about his paper and his philosophy about wilderness, and he basically, from Thomas Jefferson, said, well, even though there's millions of people in the United States and only a small percentage of them will ever go in the world, they have the right to have that opportunity. So that's, that's how he argued that. He was responding to someone that said that he was crazy, basically. A lot of people thought he was crazy. Because yeah. back then, think about the utilitarian view of people. And then Bob was saying, oh, no, no roads. No, you know, he was, he was one of the big wilderness philosophers. And he, started, he did it so young. That's how he, by 1928, he was already well-known in the Forest Service for his 40-mile hikes, for his, his enthusiasm and his philosophy. So great question. And, and in that article, um, he went with a lot of different philosophers and, and some of the most classic quotes. Just remember, this guy in 1928, how old was he, Jacob? You know? 1928? Yeah. 
he was uh, super young, wasn't he? Like, he was something like 20, 20. Yeah. 27 years old. Yeah. He just published the landmark paper on <laughs> It really, said, really makes you really makes you think about, uh, you know, your life and what you have accomplished by your age. It's like, my God. <laughs> well, you're pretty young too, but you aren't quite that young. And no, no. Some of the statements coming out of Bob out of that little paper he wrote have lived forever in wilderness uh, jargon. We need the tonic of wilderness. Uh -huh. The solitude, complete independence, and beauty of undefiled panorama is absolutely essential to happiness. We have passion for wilderness, just as genuine as the yearning for love and beauty. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is possible only in wilderness. So he had all these, he was 28 years old when he wrote this. Yeah. Years old. So this was a very well-planned trip. I'll just get, keep moving along here. Um, he found out he could be emotionally inspired by wilderness up until now. He had been in Montana several years. He wanted to see how this big Bob Marshall primitive area, this big primitive area that this consists of three um, individual primaries. He wanted to see how it was administered. That's why he went through this trip. So on August 29th, the next day, he went around Spotted Bear up to the um, top of Spotted Bear Lookout, which is a pretty good hump. I was up there this, this year. And then back to Spotted Bear and then all the way into Black Bear. So he walked 40 miles that day. 40 miles. And he met with Jim Deal, who was a ranger at Black Bear. Friend of Henry Thole, the greatest forester ranger to ever have lived. And so he went to Black Bear the first day. The second day from Black Bear, he hiked 42 miles over Pagoda to Salt Mountain, the top of the Chinese wall, and back on the same day, 42 yeah. miles. And his, his, his saying of pure aesthetic rapture, he was, he was still formulating these definitions of wilderness. So now you, you've spent some time around the Chinese wall in the base here this summer, yep. right? Yeah, just this summer I did. Uh, is, yep. So is this from more or less the middle of the wall right here? This is this is from what this is from White River Pass. This okay. Is the end of the wall. Sure. You were probably along up in here somewhere. Yep. Not sure. Um, so then the third day, he hiked past Big Salmon Lake on his way to White River and Big Prairie. Um, that was only thirty-one miles. So that was a that was a short day for him. And he. Uh. <laughs> were unbelievable and he took 100 photos too and how he yeah. did it and he, and he evangelized at every cabin trying to bring people over to the concept of wilderness and so he reached reached the white river at joe's camp late afternoon august 31st 1928 we know we know he left there at 4 40 p.m that's how how i don't know a, a possessed this guy was yeah and, but did he meet joe that day we don't know for sure we know he eventually did because they had um mutual friends but um, I can't believe, though, that Bob would walk past here. Joe's great big hit, corrals, his big lodge, a barn. I mean, how could he not have seen it and wonder, what the heck is this in the middle of the wilderness, you know? Deal probably told him he was going to, so was, was Joe there? Did they talk? I'd like to think they did. So summing this up, then, this is kind of an aside a little bit, but I thought it was important to talk about. Um, Bob was like a 1970s hippie that was dropped into the 1928 South Fork. Uh, a lot of the utilitarian people in there, and, and, and Dave Owen, who's in his uh, approaching 90, he had a lot of the, he heard a lot of the God, because he, he, he was in, in the 1960s, Dave was uh, the uh, ranger of Big Prairie. So he heard a lot of the uh, talk about Bob, it was several decades before, but some of the Packers were still there, and they called him, quote, odd, <clears throat> a little bit off. Yeah. He yeah. was an evangelist. Yeah. He would try to convert all these people to love and, and to think, think that wilderness is super important. Because there was a lot of, oh, especially in the Middle Fork portion of the Bob, there was a lot of proposals to build roads and everything in there. And they had, every one of them had to be fought. And there was a, a dam proposal on the Middle Fork. So, so Bob wasn't afraid to join that fight. Um, and in fact, his next paper that he wrote when he was um, 30, 29 or 30, was called The Problem with the Wilderness. And that in that, he called for the formation of the Wilderness Society, which we'll get to. So he was at Big Prairie, uh, August 31st and through September 2nd. <clears throat> he met with Henry Thole, who, as I said, is probably the greatest Forest Service Ranger ever to live, and this is Henry right here, and discussed wilderness concepts with him. <clears throat> he made a big hike on September 1st uh, to Prisoner Lake Lookout, just still learning the wilderness. 
and took an evening stroll to the headwaters with, with Bill. So basically just enjoy Big Prairie. <coughs> and on September 2nd, he left and crossed the bridge over the South Fork and hiked out on the lake and began his work at John Hopkins. And by the way, the next year, he went to Alaska to work on his, his research project and named Gates of the Arctic. So oh, he, yeah. he was 30, 29 or 30 years old. The guy was just fast forward in his life and that's <laughs> very young, so it's a good thing. <clears throat> so going through the book now, so that, that, that goes through the cowboy and the academic, which is kind of a part of the book. And I wanted to expand on it because it's, it's imp important. It seems to me very important to yeah. look at how these two were juxtaposed to save the wilderness. So then some of the other chapters in the book included um, George Ostrom, and you had this great photo over here that you allowed, uh, you and George allowed me to scan. Uh, he was a smoke jumper into the bottom. Yeah. A lot of adventures, you would want to read those, they're fun. Um, he hurt his leg and then the great um, Packer Toad uh, Allen made a, a, a crutch for him on a lodge pole so he could get down into the in Black Bear Cabin. There's a lot of great adventures in there. Um, early smoke jumping, the first smoke jumpers into the bottom. George was the first, pretty much. Close. Yep. Uh, Bill Workman, who, uh, let me see if I can move this so you can see Bill there. Bill Workman has been packing for 40 years in the Bob, uh, 41 or two, and he has ridden uh, over 40,000 miles in the Bob Marsh. Now think about it, you went up to the Chinese Wall and you had a pretty long hike, but was it 50 miles maybe or something? Total, yeah. total. Yeah. Yeah. He's done 40,000 miles. Yeah. It's hard to believe. I think he had to list how many nights he spent at Black Bear Cabin. It was like hundreds and hundreds. So he's lived a big portion of his life in the wilderness. He was just named to the Cow Montana Cowboy Hall of Fame. Oh, geez. Cool. <laughs> and there's a lot of great stories uh, hmm, that Bill told me in the book. And uh, sorry about that. And you can see him again here. Um, just a master packer. He had, you know, takes uh, all alone, takes strings of up to 12 mules. So you got to know what the heck you're doing to do that. Yeah, you do. And so Bud Moore's Wilderness Experiment is another part of the book. Uh, Bud uh, wanted to see what online trapping in the winters could still be. He was in Loxo when he was a youngster, he did it. And he, after he retired from Forest Service, he, he uh, recreated it in the Bob. And I follow that story all through the Bob. I, I, I've known Bud since 1992, worked with him. Um, he reviewed some papers I did about the Bob Marshall when I was an admi you know, administrator in the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Got to know him and then um, promoted his book, The Loxa Story, in 1996. And then he reviewed both of my first two books. Oh, yeah. Helped me out a lot. And so I think you'll find that chapter exciting. He's, and he, he's actually a big friend of Norman McLean. Uh, and in that chapter, I, we talk about how Norman helped him locate his cabin site down the coyote forest down the swamp because Norman lived in or had his, his cabin in City Lake. And they interacted a lot. And so there's some fun stuff in there about that. And then um, Greg and Deb Schatz are some of the best volunteers that have ever worked for the foundation, the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation, which that's my hat right there. Um, this, is a, this is a picture of them packing out uh, where they were packing out uh, dogs they found that were lost in the wilderness. It's a great story. Oh, yeah. And you can, you can see Deb and, and Greg on top of uh, Curry Reef right here. So they were <laughs> a lot of great wreck stories. And, and you know, Bill, Bill Workman's stories are priceless in this book, the guy we just talked about, because he had different mule wrecks, horse wrecks, uh, philosophies about mules versus horses. It's just, it's pretty, pretty funny. And then Fred Flint, Call him volunteer man because he's he worked for the Forest Service for 40 and now he's he's um, volunteering for the foundation. Now <clears throat> I wanted to uh, read a couple things about Fred in the book here because it's uh, it's pretty funny. Um, what I say about Fred is everybody that's been in the Bob has been to cabins, which of course Fred has done for all these years and maintained them. You know all about pack rats. Pack rats have this filthy urine paste that they put all over everything. If they get in a building or an outhouse or, a, or your, heaven forbid, your cabin, you're gonna smell it for years. So there's a war between pack rats and rangers. I call it the war between the rangers and the rodents. And what I said in the book was, 
Fred is a four-star general in the wilderness war on vermin. <laughs> because he, I don't know how politically correct we need to be, maybe I better. Uh, one of the things uh, he told me was, um, one of the best ways of killing a pack rat is to isolate it and then use a sledge, the combination of a sledgehammer and a, and a pitchfork to kill it. Because they're not easy to get. And everybody I interviewed had pack rat stories. You, John, you must have you must have like some kind of an affinity for pack rats because it feels like they pop they pop up in your uh, your writings, you know more <laughs> more more maybe more than your typical uh, you know Western history stories. Yeah, that's true. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm a biologist, you know. So, that's true. <laughs> um, but what Fred said was um, one of the best ways I found to get them is with a piece of stovepipe. Put a rat trap at each end and facing outwards, and you got them. They love to run through the stovepipe. Sometimes you don't have the opportunity, though, and you have to improvise. So one of the things he talked about that was quite funny uh, was at the, at the Salmon Forks cabin, about eight miles up the west side of the South Fork Trail. Crews have been fighting a mostly losing battle with pack rats for decades. They just can't get them out of that one. On one occasion, Keith Granrude woke up in the middle of the night at the cabin. A bold and unrepentant pack rat was running around the cabin at will, seemingly confident that people posed no threat to him. Crew members had just about given up trying to get him. Nothing had worked. That night, this one night, the in-your-face pack rat was up in the rafters having a good old time. Keith shined a flashlight and held it on him, and the rat made a fatal mistake. It froze. <laughs> Keith grabbed his pistol and shot it out of the rafters, and the rat spun around and landed on one of the bunks. That did in the rat, said Fred. Yeah. <laughs> the report from the gunshot just about did in the crew. They levitated out of their bed. So imagine <laughs> the pistol inside. Of, and, you know, I hate to be so down on the pack rats, but they are really quite In fact, one, at yeah. Grant, uh, Fred finally burned down a storage uh, building there and rebuilt it because he just couldn't get the smell and the pack rats out of it. Mm. So that's Volunteer Man. A lot of great funny stories. In fact, this chapter is the one that has the story of the rooster named Bob Marshall. And I don't, oh, yeah. want, to, I don't want to spoil that one by telling it. But you know. <laughs> so Pat McVeigh, 100 um, <clears throat> year old, uh, he reached 100 on March 14th of this year, and he passed away on May 18th of this year. And I had the privilege of knowing Pat for 30 over 30 years, because so I was a hunter ed coordinator. He was our first hunter ed instructor. He had actually instructed hunter education for 60 years. In my previous book, there's a story about Pat and his, and a plane crash he found in the wilderness. This story about um, his Bob Marshall secret. And his Bob Marshall secret kind of encapsulates the purpose of writing this book, of preserving these stories of these people, all these folks. And <clears throat> he, he had a lot of funny things that happened to him on a big long pack trip. But his pack, his his secret, his Bob Marshall secret goes like this. Pat McVeigh's secret to a long life was one shot of whiskey per day and two long summer trips in the Bob per year. That was his secret. And it's pretty hard to argue because <clears throat> on the on the trip that I profile in the book, he and uh, another lady, Myla Kenyon, both lived to be, eventually both lived to be over 100. And the other three people that were with him were all in their late 80s, 90s. So he must have something going on there. <clears throat> I might, I might have to start subscribing to that, uh, that, <laughs> that, uh, that method of long life. We'll see. It well, seems like a lot of fun. At the very least, it seems like a lot more fun. Yeah, you're getting the, you're getting the trips down in the Bob. That one classified your, your Chinese wall trip. I, I would like to do it too, but I don't drink. So I can't, the whiskey part <laughs> happen. But, uh, but the Bob part does. So I wanted to read this thing to preserve Pat's because he can't be around to talk about it. He died a few months ago. <clears throat> but this is just sort of a feeling of what it's like to go through the Bob a little bit and some of the funny things that happened to him. So first of all, the Chinese wall, I thought I'd read this because if anyone hasn't seen it. So it forms part of the Continental Divide and it runs south to north from the White River Pass to the Large Hill Pass. So this dramatic serpentine Paleozoic limestone reef stands more than a thousand feet high and it's fin like you probably noticed it's like it looks like a fin that springs out of the out of the uh, out of the earth and maybe it's the most profound and calming view in the bottom in my opinion it is 
There's really nothing quite like it in the Rockies, <clears throat> but, <clears throat> and it's a big but, it has a reputation for fireworks. I don't know if you ran into this or not, as far as lightning. It draws lightning. So Pat's riding over Large Hill Pass, which is in the, the northern end. I, I think, I don't know if you went as far as Large Hill when you went. <clears throat> and it's 7,713 feet. And they noticed, oh, it was a beautiful day, right? But they noticed that the sky was darkening. Uh-oh. <laughs> they're at 7,700 feet, and they're in the middle of nowhere, and they've got to drop down the other side. Yeah. I'll quote Pat now. When we came near the pass, a hell of a lightning storm surrounded us. Just came out of nowhere, said Pat. Got dark and foreboding all of a sudden. So quickly, we were intent on keeping our string together and calling down the horses. Now, the next line, I've asked a lot of people about this. I'm not sure. This is what Pat says, and I always take it words to the bank. He was riding his horse for Rowdy. I looked over at Rowdy, and I saw sparks dancing back and forth between his ears. I, that, I've asked a lot of horsemen. They haven't seen that. They've seen it, like, around its metal bit, you know? Really? Yeah. Between his ears. <laughs> it was a scary experience, and we tried to hurry without spooking the horses. So they ride down into Rushy Park and the White River, and he talks about getting, they basically got hit by lightning. They got hit by the force of the lightning. They all felt it. I've had that happen to me, too. And talks about that. But then he gets down into the White River, and I spend a few pages talking about this, this very wonderful, calm fishing he does all along the river after the storm broke and the sun came out and caught a lot of fish. And then here's what happened. <clears throat> so I had enough for breakfast, said Pat. I cleaned them. These are all West Slope cutthroat. Cut off the heads, line them up in a dish pan. I put some water and salt in the pan with them and set them on the panniers over by a tree and didn't think much more about them. And they got their breakfast all set. It was a beautiful evening and the travelers gathered under a stretched tarp to relax. And then here, here Pat continues. We were sitting there having a tiddly. Remember, they, they're, they're one whiskey a night. <laughs> and we looked out and saw this old mule deer doe wander into camp, said Pat. The campers enjoyed watching the beautiful animal calmly walk around camp, but they weren't too happy about what the doe did next. <laughs> she wandered around a little bit, walked over and looked at the packs, and then she came back to the dish pan. I couldn't believe it. I said, hey, Gene. She's eating our fish. So five of us watched her eat every dang one of those cutthroat out of the pan. Now, I've never heard of this before. <laughs> Pat said the piscivorous mule deer would eat a trout, look over at them, and then eat another one. We were kind of stunned, said Pat. We just sat there and thought about it for a while, but I'd never seen anything like it before. None of us had. So the next morning, as sunlight filled the White River range, Pat collected his fishing rod and flies and caught a second batch of fish. <laughs> they protected the fish in a pack box until Ruth got busy cooking them. Now that's incredible. You are eating fish. Now I have seen when I was snorkeling for kokanee on the on the um, McDonald Creek before when there was a big run up there. I have seen. Um, I did see mule deer eat those kokanee that, that spawn and then die. I did. Really? See, yeah. But I've certainly never heard of this in the Bob. Was that was that before uh, you read this story from Pat? Oh yeah, that would have been in the wow. early '80s. Yeah. So you so you already knew that uh, you know deer are not strictly herbivores sometimes. True, but it's so rare, and it's yeah. only when there's an overabundance of of like spawning fish, and there's so many of them. You know, wow. Just like an overabundance of food. But. Right. So the thing that that this distills so well for me is that Pat is gone now, but I have a dozen you know, electronic recordings of his, um, of his interviews. So I have that. And then we have, we now have his story in this book, just like in the last book. And here, here just goes to show, show how timely this was. So Nick talking about the friends, two of them which lived to be a hundred. The friends would share many more trips and miles as the years marched on. It's hard to argue about Pat's theory that these trips and the shots of whiskey the travelers enjoyed each evening lengthened their lives. Pat and Myla became centenarians, and I got a chance to talk to both of them at the same time on a little conference call. Two 100-year-old people. It was amazing. In fact, I think Myla was 102. <laughs> so then here's the paragraph that brings it all home for me. <clears throat> Looking back over a half a century of trips into the backcountry, Pat said, and this is his quote, gosh, 
I wish I could do it all again. <clears throat> it's so real in there. Everything that happens is unplanned. Nothing in this world is better for the spirit. I never wrote anything down. I just kept it in my heart. So obviously, his heart now is part of this book. And if I wouldn't have done this, we wouldn't have done this, the stories would have been lost. You know? I mean, it, I'm sure his family thinks, uh, knows a lot of them, <clears throat> but to develop them like that. So that really, that really brought it home for me. So moving on through the book then, uh, George Anderson of Shoto was law enforcement for 30 years over there. He just kind of typifies all these little towns all around the Bob and all the law enforcement that, that cooperates with the Forest Service and others to save people, there's some rescues and there's some fun stories in here. The tree hugging criminal is a good one. <laughs> and, and when I think when you went over the Chinese wall, you went to in the Shoto Augusta area yep. mm -hmm. to start out. And that's where that's where George did his patrolling. So there's some great stories in there about that. And then <clears throat> the young folks now, the younger generation, adding their own dedication, making their own history. This is Colin Hislop here. And here she is with some of the trail crew. And they do such a great job in there. And they, basically what they do is so you and I can go in there. They keep these trails open and they keep people that are patrolling back there in case someone has a, uh, a problem or <clears throat> an accident. So we go, we went from Joe Murphy, Bob Marshall, all the way up to the present. Right. Guy Zollner <clears throat> is part of the long line of Big Prairie Rangers. He's actually raising a family in the Bob as he is the chief ranger at Ran at Big Prairie, he followed in, in the footsteps of Danaher and Henry Thole all the way from pre-1900 up until now. This is Guy right here and his wife Keegan, Ryle, and Greg. I just, ha I just happened to see Guy, uh, Keegan, and Ryle the other day. They're out. You know, they come out in November. They go in in, in, in May or June. Hmm. So that's got a lot of great stories in it. And you can see they just live in the Bob and they, have, they catch frogs and swim in the river. It's just a wonderful life. Um, you can see here <laughs> Ray Keegan riding in with the two of them when they were really little. She is a brave woman. And I, I, <laughs> um, I spent uh, 10 days in a big prairie two years ago volunteering for them as the station guard where you greet people and explain the area, give them Kool-Aid, you know, mm. do, clean, keep the station clean, handle the radio. And I was so impressed with <clears throat> both of these. Uh, folks, but a Keegan I called the woman who knows all things because anything that happened, whether it was the propane in the refrigerator or how to handle the radio, she, she knew how to do it. <clears throat> One of the other really interesting things on this in this particular book is um, Bob Cooney was the first biologist in the Bob, and he actually did the first grizzly bear study. These are some of his original uh, diaries. Here's Bob Cooney right here. <clears throat> he saw ptarmigan and, and and documented that and documented Grizzly. He was one of the first person to, uh, if not the first, to identify that relationship between the pine bark, uh, white bark pine and the grizzly bear and those pine nuts that were hidden by the nut hatch. <clears throat> he was maybe the first person to notice that. And I was able to do it because his journals had been lost and Jim Williams of the Fish, Black and Parks found his box of journals up in the attic of our office in Kalispell. How they got here, I mean, yeah. and wow. then picked in at, uh, at MSU, who is very familiar with the area, he typed it all up and then I was able to use that to bring that story live onto the landscape from 1941. So that's a fun chapter, a lot of, a lot of information about grizzly bears. Uh, Smoke Elzer, the greatest storyteller of the Bob, his, his stories are unbelievable. Um, I was on another presentation where he gave a story that's not even in the book, although he's got some great stories in the book, uh, where they watched the first uh, they watched the landing uh, 1969. They watched the moon landing from the top of Jumbo Lookout in the middle of the Bob by using a little old TV and some sort of oh. a antenna system. <laughs> it's oh. the story I've ever heard. But yeah. some of the stories are terrific, like his lost hunter, uh, fluorescent hunter, um, this kid that came riding to his camp and then went riding out with his dad. Uh, they think maybe we're some spiritual. Um, in some way because it was in the middle of the night and the rain and they were going to ride another 30 miles. There's just a lot of great stories in there and you can see there's there's smoke right there. And smoke uh, has, is probably the most famous outfitter in the in the Bob in Montana anywhere. There's a lot of his great stories in here including, including Hole in the Wall, the legend of Hole in the Wall and uh, 
and the, and and whether was there really any treasure in it? And he answers that question by somebody that uh, repels into it. Oh yeah, yeah. So this is Smoke and Thelma. They're still doing well in Missoula, and uh, I was honored to include him in the book. So ending up then. Uh, first of all, any other points about what we went over so far? Jake, Jake, before I end up. Well, I, I certainly have some questions, but um, we, yeah, we can, you can wrap it up and then we can talk a little bit. Yeah. All right. So the last chapter in the book <clears throat> is a very important one to me because I feel that there's spirits in the Bob Marshall, and I don't know how to define that. It's up to everybody's faith tradition. This is Big Prairie one night in 2018. When I was sitting, I took a chair from the ranger station, set out in the middle of the big prairie and watch the sunset and look at look at the sunset and I thought about the rangers that had all left their DNA in there you know like John Merworkla was a re, uh, assistant ranger in there right oh for a long time he actually shot himself trying to kill a pack rat <laughs> that's in the previous book um, but you know the, your DNA and your elements cycle through the vegetation and they're always in there they always cycle and, and so if there's physical aspects that can do that, why couldn't spiritual aspects do it? And in my in my chapter, where I talk about it is my friend Terry McCoy and I were freshmen together at University of Montana, majoring in wildlife. And we we were um, I was on a, a hike up to Upper Holland Lake in the Bob. I was 19 and met this kind of mysterious ranger after I looped around, and he told me a place to go try hunting because I had told him, hey, I saw a bull elk intended there and I, I didn't I, I wish it would have been hunting season and he said <clears throat> hey kid it is hunting season back here there's an early rifle season for elk and deer I said oh, really he said yeah and I would if I were you I would try well and it was this place was about 20 miles to the south I don't want to give it away because there's outfitters that may not like that I do but <laughs> anyway uh, <clears throat> so I thought well I'm going to go back in and try it you know we can still hunt it was like September 20th when I talked to him well Later, I found out after asking everybody, and I'm still asking, that there is no ranger stationed at Upper Holland Lake. Hmm. So chew on that for a while. This was this old guy that said he was stationed there, but there really wasn't anybody. And so I hiked up. We, my friend Terry McCoy and I, the next week, it was October 6th, I believe, in 1973. So we hiked up to this, this mountain lake. <clears throat> and uh, that evening, I saw this big mule there. had him in my scope, but... It was just a little too, not quite light enough to shoot. The next morning we woke up along the divide there and we were going to have a fire before we went hunting. And Terry said, did you hear that elk bugle? I said, no. I, I, Listen, there it is right there. I could not hear it. I couldn't hear it. And my hearing was good then. And I could not hear it. He said, let's go, let's go. So we grabbed our packs and our rifles and we went up over these, these shelves. And this is really close to where this this old timer who did or did not exist, I'm not sure, told me to go. And so he kept saying, it's just right here. There it is again. And this was a mile away, by the way. And I don't know how he could have possibly heard it because <clears throat> I couldn't hear anything. So we got it and I thought, well, I'll humor Terry and we'll, I'll go along with him here, but I don't think we're going to see any elk when we look over this ridge. So we got up to this shelf. <clears throat> we looked over the ridge and there was a bull elk. And it was feeding on this bear crest, bear crest slope. He tried to shoot it twice, his, his gun misfired, and the third time he shot it, it backed up. I was just about ready to take it and, and you know, rolled slightly down the hill. So the way I put it was Terry McCoy had bagged an elk that bugled a song that only he could hear. So to me, it was kind of spooked. The whole thing was kind of spooky. Well, that was October of 73. And in August of 74, Terry died. He was killed in a plane crash flying for elk hmm. in the welcome, what's now the Welcome Creek Wilderness. <clears throat> and so he was not allowed to live his <clears throat> wilderness life where I was. I've you know, lived a long wilderness life since then, gone into the Bob hundreds of times. And I always felt that he was given that gift because he didn't have much longer to live. So and then that leads me into my next book. I explore the first very long chapter. I explore the... Um, <clears throat> The plane crash, we would go back and visit it, and just the whole spiritual meaning of the whole thing. And so that's how I kind of wrapped up this book. Uh, there's lots of great stories through the chapters that I didn't, of course, tell. But, right. And so I don't know what you think about that, Jacob, but I think there's, every, all of us have our own way of thinking about this. And I think there's, there's some spiritualness to, to the wilderness. 
Yeah, I, I kind of find that too. Um, you know, personally, you know, it kind of in, in two ways for me and, you know, maybe, maybe not as um, super, you know, I, I wouldn't call it supernatural, but may, maybe not in the same way that you do. Um, it just kind of that rejuvenating feeling, that reawakening that you, you can't get anywhere else. Like, um, yeah, you're, you're by, you know, you, you go out and hike 20 miles to, to a remote location and yeah, your body might feel like it's aged 10 years, but it feels like your, your mind and your spirit are, 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 are brand new, you know, feels like, um, so much of a weight is, is lifted off of you in a way, you know, it doesn't yeah. really matter what's going on elsewhere. And I can't really explain that feeling, you know, it, it is, you know, it, people say it's kind of probably like meditation or, you know, other people related to getting a massage or whatever makes them feel relaxed. But to me, it's, it, it's a little bit different. It's more of a, it's more of a mind and soul. And there's just, there's just the whole experience. It's hard to put into words. I also, and this is, the, this is just me. I, I like the feeling of going out and being surrounded by nature and just thinking, you know, thinking about the life force of it all, you know, that we're all just kind of carbon molecules and it's, it's not too different than, you know, me or this plant or, you know, any of the other living things around. And, you know, it's, it's very comforting to know that, you know, to me, it's comforting to know that when you die, uh, you know, your, your body degrades the same way that these plants and animals do. And you just kind of eventually give life to, to the next, uh, the thing that's coming after. So I like that. I like that part of, uh, you know, kind of the natural experience as well. And I get a lot of that in the Bob Marshall wilderness. Good. Yeah, that's, that's very good. And one of my favorite books is Make Prayers to the Raven by Richard Nelson. Richard Nelson was an incredible writer. Uh, <clears throat> he also wrote The Island Within. And uh, he said that the Koyakons that he studied, anthropological study on, he says, they felt that there was very little difference between the natural and the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Answer. <laughs> so, two on that a while. <laughs> can we do some trivia questions? So I get off of the soft share? So we're sure we can do that. Okay. All right, Jake. Now you're on. All right. You're representing the whole, <clears throat> the whole, the whole crowd that's out there. How about this, John? You ask me a question, and then I've got a couple questions about about this uh, this most recent book in your work, and we'll just alternate. Okay. So I'll okay. I'll, I'll make I'll make a fool of myself. And then I'll turn it over to you and you can sound smart again. Well, the first one is a little bit, if you're not schooled up right at the moment, there's three actual individual wildernesses that make up the Bob Marshall complex. Name those three wildernesses. Uh, the, the Great Bear is not one of them, correct? That's North? Yes, it is. Okay. Great Bear. Scapegoat? Yes. And, um, and another one. Well, think of the other one. It's very simple. It's the... It's the the individual name of the overall complex, the Bob Marshall itself. The Bob Marshall wilderness is 950,000 acres. It was, by the way, this is the 80th anniversary of the, uh, on August 16th of the Bob. And it was designated in it as three primitive areas coming together. Then it was legally codified in 64 during the act, but. So it wasn't the Sun River, was it? The, the primitive, no, the Bob. It, so it's a scapegoat, the okay, Bob Marshall. Gotcha. Right. And yeah, and, and, and so, um, and the Bob originally was put together from three primitive areas, which was the Sun River, the Pentagon, and right. the South Fork. So anyway, the three wildernesses make up 1.5 million acres. When I was going in my next book, I, there was quite a bit of, about the scapegoat and, and so on. And that wasn't a wilderness until 1972. Um, and then we used to call it the Lincoln backcountry when I was an undergrad. And then the, the Great Bear uh, was established since 1978. And then, uh, you know, the Bob had been in 1940, it was declared the Bob Marshall in, in, oh, nice. in honor of Bob Marshall, who died just earlier that year at a, only at age 38. Right. Okay. That's, that's my first trivia question. All right. I'll, I'll, I got, um, I'll give myself two out of three for that. <laughs> so, um, so the, the previous, you know, two books that I've read of yours, the uh, woman's way West and the Rangers, Trappers and Trailblazers. You know, especially Rangers, Trappers, and Trailblazers, with a couple of exceptions in the chapters. Um, it was like you mentioned the, the McVeigh story, um, much more focused on the past. Whereas a lot of this one, maybe maybe fifty percent of it even, 
is is really about the present, about what's happening now, about the people that are still currently using this land. Um, just so how did your approach change writing about the past and writing about, you know, the, the present and the future? And how, um, how did you find that rewarding in, in, in kind of different ways? That's a great question because you're right exactly about the two books. In Ranger Trappers Trailblazers, just about everyone there has passed. Uh, so I was doing research of their writings, their photos, um, newspaper articles, a lot more of that uh, than in the current book. And, you know, there were a few folks that were still uh, um, present when I wrote Range of Trappers. But, but yeah, it was <clears throat> a lot more of a, a lot more historical research. And then Heroes was a lot more interviewing, a lot of interviewing, even though I did. In fact, my previous book, Wild River Pioneers, which I'm making that we're working on, Far Country and, and, and I are working on the second edition, came out in 2008. That one, everybody, pretty much everybody I interviewed and everybody that was in the book have passed. And it's, that just shows you how fast it goes. I mean, when I was writing the Lake Lady of Glacier Park section of, the, of that previous book, I was actually working on that in 1990 hmm. for, for Woman's Way West Lady passed away she did she reviewed that story on her deathbed but everybody I, I counted up was like 18 people i interviewed and i don't know how many a dozen that were associated with the story and by a few years ago they were all dead and so if you don't capture it right you're going to lose it and one other thing that you that reminds me i got so i got an envelope from jamie murphy the other day and she showed me she's one of the pictures she she put in was this one I don't know how you can see it, but you can see this group of young ladies. Uh huh. All these wonderful young ladies. There's there's seven of them there, and Janie, and that's Janie. And on the back, she wrote, "All have died but me." Yeah. So it's it's they they went in with Joe on the packing trip, but they've all passed. It just shows you how fast it goes. And by yeah. the way, a little quick story about Joe and Janie. So Janie pretty much would do whatever Joe, you know, she was cooking for Joe, her dad. He was the leader, owner of the outfit. And they had, and this, I didn't get into much of this, but there's a lot of controversy between mules versus horses. So she got, she took riding a mule because she really liked riding this mule. It was real stable. <clears throat> the only time that Joe ever gave her any direct advice, he pulled her aside at one time, one point. And you can see where they were like, that was right below the Chinese wall, that picture that I just showed you. And you probably walked right over past that. Um, hmm. Took her aside, he said, now Janie, I noticed you're riding that mule. Can't do it, Jane. Can't have that. Can't have the, the owner of the outfit's daughter riding a mule. Just doesn't look good. Got to stop. <laughs> it's funny. Some people like mules. and Some people, it's like an insult to ride a mule. But that was the one thing he told her. So, all right. Your, is it your turn to ask a question? No, it's your, unfortunately, it's your turn to ask a question. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Now, you should know this. Okay. What's the most famous feature of the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex, and how long is it? Well, it's the Chinese Wall. Um, Good. Are we talking the north part or the south part, or from the whole thing? March Hill Pass to White River. The, the, to White River, okay. That's, that's, the, that's the actual Chinese Wall that looks like a fin that came up. Right, on. right. So I believe, let's see. So this is where I can make a fool of myself. Let's see. <laughs> Is it something like, I want to say it's something like 10 miles long, eight? That's really close. It's 12. 12, okay. Good hmm. job. Well, uh, again, again that, that's, a solid, that's a solid B minus. But you know what? That's still passing. I'll oh, take yeah. That. Yeah. So um, uh, I know, so this, this book, Heroes of the Bob Marshall Wilderness, it's all about the, the, the kind of the people that use this land, not so much the land itself. Although, of course, you do touch on that. Um, did you find, and then this is kind of fresh in my mind because I just curated this Glacier National Park exhibit, and of course the um, American Indian history with that and how that land, you know, changed ownership and is still, it was used and is still very much a, a part of some of the American Indian tribal culture. Um, did you touch on any of that in your research, um, the, the tribes that... Um, yeah have a sacred connection to the Bob Marshall Wilderness? I'm glad you asked that because it gives me an, uh, an opportunity to explain that. So yeah. 
previous book, um, Danaher, the original ranger up there and others interacted with some of the tribes uh, folks that were in there in Sayers Kootenai. Of course, the Blackfeet in Sayers Kootenai had battles, had a battle, at least one battle in there in the Danaher. Uh, that the, the sign's gone now, but I have a picture that huh. would fit. Um, and so to that extent, actually, um, in the forward to this book, the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation director, uh, president, the foundation, I guess, executive director, Bill Hodge, he talks about it a little bit. But I, I have worked with the tribes for many years, over 30 years with the uh, Sayers Kootenai on biological projects, various ones, and and with the the Flooded Reservation Fish and Wildlife Board and I, and one of the, my counterpart down there, um, Rich Jansen, once told me when we were starting first starting to work together is, um, you know, you shouldn't speak for others. And he was talking about a specific plan we were working on or something, but I thought, I think he means that generally. And so I, being of my own culture, you know, I'm an, uh, from, my, my ancestors are from Ireland and England or whatever. Um, I don't feel like I have an understanding, a good understanding of native culture. So for me to interview those folks and try to uh, explain why they do things, their motivations, like I have with the, the, right. the here, I just didn't feel confident and I, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> right. Well, no, that makes sense. They appreciate I think they appreciate that. Well, yeah, exactly. And then, then, and you know, you're, you are very right and you're correct and I'm, I'm glad you shared that. There is that disconnect that you will try and try and try to, to bridge that gap, but you, you'll never know if you have bridged it completely or successfully or, you know, you, you as coming from your background, you'll never have the, the, the basic foundation of even which questions to ask, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's the way I feel about that. I mean, I have my own spirituality, I have my own right. culture, and I know that. And you're supposed to write about what you know, right? Sure. <laughs> I worked with the tribes a long time, and we, you know, teamed up on a lot of biological reports and right. all kinds of things we've gone through together um, in my position at FWP, and that's different. Uh, but when it comes to trying to to go into the wilderness and explain it, I, I stick to what I know. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Another trivia question. Okay. Oh, this one's easy. Oh, you can't say no, no, no. Don't say that, John, because it's going to look even worse when I don't know the answer. <laughs> well, you'll have to read my my next book because my next book okay. I I have a nineteen thousand word chat, sixteen thousand word chapter on this. Okay. In a fun way, name the two native trout on the west side of the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex. That would be in the South Fork drainage, Middle Fork drainage. So the West Slope Cutthroat are there, correct? Good. And uh, uh, bro brook trout? Species. No, it's a threatened species. Okay. It's related, it's related to the brook trout, but it, it actually swims all the way up into there from uh, at least it swims up into the Middle Fork from Flatted Lake, and then from Three Horse Reservoir, it swims up into the South Fork, and it will be the bull trout. Okay, interesting. Yeah. See, so, uh, history, history, I can, I can attempt to get these things. When, once you start bringing, uh, you know, biology and zoology and fishery stuff into the mix, then, then you've lost me. I only got cutthroat because you said it a couple times in your presentation. <laughs> you see, you're a, you're a historian. I'm a biologist. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You, should, you should team <laughs> up on a book. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Do you have any more questions? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, so John, I just want to say it's, it, even though it was just you and I today talking, it's, it's always a pleasure to sit down and talk with you about your work and um, the, the Bob Marshall wilderness, obviously, uh, you know, very important place to you. And, you know, I'm trying to get there as much as possible myself and, yeah, it's, um, yeah it's, it's always a pleasure. And I just want to say thank you for, for coming to the, the museum and having this conversation today and, you know, sharing your knowledge and your work with, with all of us um, at our homes right now. You bet. And I forgot to ask you the last two trivia questions. Two? Which, oh, yeah. okay. you'll know this one. What's the largest lake in the Bob Marshall Wilderness? The largest lake in the Bob Marshall Bob, Wilderness? Bob hiked by it in 1928. He, Bob hiked by it? Passed it on his way to Big Prairie. It starts with big. Big. Salmon. 
Big Salmon Lake. Have you, you, you haven't been there? That, no, because it takes like 20 miles to hike in, doesn't it? It's 20. Well, that, yeah. was in the middle, that was in the middle of my next book. I talk about my dash to the Bob where I go 44 miles in one right. day. I went right by Big Salmon. You, okay, you've got the credentials of being in the Chinese Wall. That's good. Have you visited Big Prairie? No, I've not gone to Big Prairie. Not on your list? And put Big Salmon Lake on your list. Okay. And because those, those are incredible places. And then the last one. Um, and this is a kind of obscure one and probably a tough one. What is the highest peak in the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex? I'm not even going to try for that one. <laughs> it's Red Mountain over in the scapegoat. Okay, interesting. And how high is that? 9,400. Okay. Something like that. There's a few other 9,000 footers, like there's Wolverine Peak in the, uh, in the Gordon Pass area, but that's the tallest one. Interesting. That was a lot of fun. And, uh, Appreciate you having me, Jacob. I know I went a little bit long, but uh, heck, we only got one shot, and people watching it, they can cut off when they want to. Exa that, see, that's exactly right. That, that's another benefit as well. And to, to everybody watching, um, if you enjoyed this, uh, we have all of John's books in our uh, School Bell Books and Gifts here at the Northwest Montana History Museum. So either stop on in and pick up a copy, or you can just give us a call and we can send you one as well. Um, and if you enjoyed this, interview of me talking with John. We have three more of these digital format interviews. Um, this winter, we have another one coming out in the early January and then another uh, two in late January. So I hope that you will uh, consider supporting the museum and um, watching one of those with your family or friends at home. But um, uh, thanks, sorry, go ahead, John. One other thing, um, <clears throat> we were talking about some way of, you know, since we don't have people uh, it's hard to give away uh, a raffle, a book on the trivia question. So what if we said that anyone that's uh, anyone that sees this and calls you got you, your museum and says and says, hey, I saw your presentation on Heroes of the Bob. Um, I want to be the first caller. And then if, if we can do that, and then I can I'll meet them at the museum and sign the book for them. Oh, very nice of you. Sure, we can do that. Yeah. So if, 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 if everything goes to plan, this will drop on January 3rd, which I believe is a Sunday. And so probably I'll get some calls in the morning of January 4th, I'm guessing. Uh, sign, cool. sign copy of uh, one of John's books. All right. Thanks, Jacob. You do a terrific job at the museum. You deserve a lot of credit. Hey, thank you, John. And thank you, everybody, for watching today at home. We'll see you later.